Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show. Happy Friday and happy Veterans Day. We're gonna have more to say about that later in a segment you do not wanna miss. Uh, it is indeed Friday. Fridays are so great, aren't they? It's like, I love my job, but I still love Fridays. You know what's coming. You're gonna have a great Friday night, ideally, with your family, people you love or wanna hang out with. Saturday, you don't have to get up at all, usually. It's so great. You have the whole weekend in front. Sorry, I'm just dreaming. I'm dreaming about where we're going. Right? It's just so good, isn't it, Abs? No list. <laughs> no list from Abby. Every day after the show, she goes over my list with me. It's torturous. It's all the stuff that I've tried to put off that I don't want to decide on. She makes me do it. Uh, okay, anywho. Um, by the way, we still don't know who won the House or the Senate. <laughs> that, that, that little thing of Congress. Uh, in Arizona, 18% of the vote is still outstanding. Again, they're right. It's an abacus. That's how they're counting the votes. And Katie Hobbs has extended her lead over Kerry Lake, we're told, to 27,000. Mark Kelly in the Senate race, remember Kerry Lake and Hobbs, that's governor. Mark Kelly remains 115,000 votes ahead of Blake Masters. In Nevada, with 10% of the vote outstanding, GOP challenger Adam Laxalt is clinging to just a 9,000 vote lead over Catherine Cortez Masto. Now, some say she's looking good to take over him based on where they think the remaining vote is coming from. He's been tweeting out, he's looking good. He doesn't think she can maintain a high enough margin. He says she needs over 65% of those votes and doesn't see her doing it. This you read a different tweet, a different article, a different expert, you will get a different answer on Nevada in particular. Most people say Arizona's gone uh, to the Dems, but on Nevada, so divided. Uh, in some places, like certain key districts in California, less than half of the votes have been counted. Get out of the damn sun, get inside, and do your jobs. <laughs> right? It's like, I don't care how pretty it is out there. Get to work, Californians. <laughs> how is this acceptable? Some people, uh, of course, have moved on, like former President Donald Trump, who has instead turned his focus to attacking all of the key figures in his own party. <laughs> in his defense, they are also attacking him. Bond Charge is a holistic wellness brand with a huge range of evidence-based products to optimize your life in every way. Founded on science and inspired by nature, all Bond Charge products adopt ancestral ways of living in our modern day world. From blue light glasses to red light therapy to EMF management and circadian friendly lighting, Bond Charge products help you naturally address the issues of our modern day way of life effortlessly. I love these guys. I wear these glasses all the time when I'm working at my desktop and often on my phone too when my eyes start to strain. Their glasses come in non-prescription, prescription, and reading options. Bond Charge also has other amazing products like low blue light bulbs, red light therapy devices, EMF 5G protection, and 100% blackout sleep masks, all backed by science. They can ship worldwide in rapid time. And most importantly, they have easy returns and exchanges. Go to bondcharge.com slash MK. Use that coupon code MK to save yourself 20% off your order. That's bond, B-O-N, charge, C-H-A-R-G-E, dot com slash MK. And use that coupon code MK to save 20%. Here to break it all down today, Rich Lowry, editor of National Review. And in a little bit, we're going to have Rick Grinnell with the Trump side of things from Rich to Rick. Rich, great to have you back. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Uh, I'm great. I'm great. So can we just talk? Isn't it absurd? I mean, California has 48% of the vote. <laughs> like, huh? it's, as, it's as if they were surprised by the fact that we were having yeah, an election. It's it's positively third world. I mean, there, there's just no excuse for it. I was reading an article yesterday trying to understand this. Why is the Arizona vote so slow? And this this article in a local Arizona paper was saying, well, you know, it, it, you can't do Maricopa County as quickly as Palm, and sorry, as Miami-Dade County because it's larger. Really? I mean, just because it's like <laughs> 1.5 million votes instead of 700,000 votes or something, you can't do it on election night. It's absurd. It's, it's inexcusable. No one should put up with it. Jeb Bush should do a national tour, giving every state a tutorial on how he fixed Florida system, and everyone should do it that way. It just shouldn't be a question. Right. I I still don't totally understand why why they're so good at it in Florida. I know why they they, they revised it, but um, I was saying yesterday, it doesn't make your state your state red to follow Florida in its <clears throat> voting procedures. It just makes it yeah. more efficient. 
Um, yep. And these guys know that they're swing states and that they should have a better system. And now on top of everything, the problems in Arizona are going to cast a massive shadow if Carrie Lake doesn't win <clears throat> because yep. her opponent is the secretary of state who oversees the voting procedure. So I know people don't like election denialism, but that's one state where you do have to pause a little and say, all right, this is going to stink to the average voter. And also, I mean, she's the most likely of any of the Republican candidates to contest her result. I mean, yes. she, she's not going to go yes. quietly. I mean, she was suggesting no. in an interview, I think it was yesterday, that uh, this is kind of the establishment slowing down the count so they can get the narrative out there that Santos did really well and hurt the MAGA candidates and she'll eventually win. I thought she was going to win. I mean, she's an extremely talented, natural politician, but she's a function of just what we saw all around the landscape. Every single Republican underperformed pretty much besides DeSantis, Kemp, and, and a few other well-established incumbents. Mm-hmm. So, well, yeah, so we don't know what's happening in Arizona. Can I ask you, because some, some people called Arizona for um, the Dem, for Mark Kelly. I saw it yesterday, and yet not everybody has. So yeah. is, is Arizona called or not? I don't think it's, I haven't seen it called. I don't think it's called, but it stands to reason, just given what we're seeing now, if if Lake wins, I mean, it's going to be just barely. And the master's theory, which I believed in, by the way, was that Lake would win by three or four points and help carry masters over the top. But that's not going to happen. So it hasn't been called, but that's one mentally and psychologically, everyone should be crossing off their list if it's still on. Mm. Mm-hmm. I think that's probably In Nevada, right. you know, and I just then- don't know. You, you, you outlined very well just, whatever you, you just read different things given the source but i am just now I, I was so burned you know last week or two by believing in republican optimism uh i had yeah. a republican senator insisting to me yesterday that that laxalt it's there for him he's gonna win and i just don't believe it i just i don't yeah. Yeah, i'll, I'll yeah. believe it if it happens but i'm assuming that's once. not gonna turn out do we know what happened with the polls? I tried to get to this discussion earlier the week. I, could, I didn't manage it because we were just tight. But do we know what happened? I know that it, the very last New York Times poll, the very last NBC News poll did pretty well in yeah. predicting the ultimate result. But, you know, Trafalgar's taking a lot of heat. Um, RCP's taking a lot of heat. I think those are, I mean, certainly Trafalgar's an operation that tries to forgive the word, but inflate a little bit Republican vote that he believed was being undercounted, which is why he got the 16 and the 18 elections so right. Right. But it seems like that methodology no longer works. So I was was looking at this because one of my colleagues was hammering, and I I love Robert Cahaley. I am sure you've had him on. He's he's a a a great, entertaining, really knowledgeable guy. Um, but one of my colleagues was hammering him for, you know, he misled us in, in New Hampshire. And then I looked back yesterday at New Hampshire at the real clear average and, and not so much at the average, but just just to get a list of the, the polls. And for the last two weeks, every poll, every poll, only Trafalgar and the University of St. Anselm had a ball deck ahead by one. But every single other poll had it really tight, you know, um, Hassan leading by one or three points. And you just look at that naturally and you see, well, it was a month ago, it was seven or nine. Now it's, you know, one or two. The momentum is his, his direction. They don't do early vote. This is a sign of, of a wave and he's going to win. And that's what I thought. Mm-hmm. So Me too. Um, we can blame the Republican pollster for getting a little bit more wrong than everyone else. But everyone got that one wrong. And I just think there was there was a kind of Democratic wave. There was a kind of blue wave at the end that she really won by nine, by the way, what? Yeah, that, that wasn't picked up. And um, my, my assumption was that all the Senate races, which were really close, the usual dynamic is uh, in, in an election you assume is defined by the incumbent's low standing, the undecided voters and the independents, they break at the end and they're going to break against the incumbent. That didn't happen. They broke in favor of the incumbent, or at least in favor of the incumbent's party. And this is still, Megan, I just have trouble getting my head around this fact. That last NBC News poll, yes, showed Democratic enthusiasm even with Republican enthusiasm. Had some good other mm-hmm. indicators for, for Democrats, but still had a lot of terrible indicators for Democrats. The most important one, Biden's approval rating in that poll is 28 percent among independents. 28 percent. That is not survival. That is not survival. And if you believe the exit polls, and there are some people say, you know, you don't because the methodology is not uh, the best, but the samples are huge. Democrats won independents by uh, a couple points. Uh, on a, on election day, and then in states like Pennsylvania and Arizona, won them by like nineteen points, thirty points. Mm-hmm. That's just hard 
it's hard to fathom. So my, my big takeaway in the election, I don't, I have various theories. I don't, I don't have high confidence. I know, I know what happened, but it just seems as though right. the issues I was dismissive of abortion, protecting democracy, Trump were more important than I, I would have thought. And uh, if there was an increment of voters that, you know, Robert Cahaley talks about Republicans who don't talk to pollsters and you don't know what they're thinking, I guess what they're thinking is that they weren't going to show up because <laughs> the turnout was just yeah. much higher for Democrats than Republicans in a lot of these key states. Wow. And and the independents, as you say, they normally break for the party out of power. And and on Tuesday, they broke for the party in power uh, for the most part. And in and most relevantly in all the states that were critical for the GOP to win, to gain control of the Senate and the House. We don't know. I mean, it's crazy that it's Friday and we don't know. And there's mm-hmm. still at least a chance yep. it could stay yep. blue. I mean, if yep. the House stays blue, <laughs> I don't even know what's going to happen. I feel like it's going to yeah. be a full-on revolt. Mind. Everyone might get fired. Everyone in the, yeah. in the Republican Party. Yeah, so the, the latest breakdown I, I saw is there's, they, they now think there are like 11 true toss-ups that are really tight, and no one can really tell you who's going to win. Um, and, and Democrats would need to win nine out of 11. So, so the odds, just pure odds, you, you think Republicans are going to win the House. But it's going to be really narrow, and um, it, it's, a massive, it's a massive disappointment. You know, there, there's still a chance they'll win the House and possibly Senate. Odds are against that. You know, and that's, that's something. Winning both chambers, you know, it, it's uh, better than the alternative. But this was a, a debacle in the scheme of things. And, and the Senate seats are just so important because the, the chance to really just knock off a bunch of Democratic incumbents it doesn't come around very often. And the Senate, you know, staggered terms of six years, it builds on itself. So you get 54 and then you have a, a really Republican map in 24. I mean, you could conceivably get to 60, right? And now that's totally... Um, out the window. So it, it was bad. And there, there should be accountability and recriminations. But isn't it, it's so confusing this time around because it's not clear what to go back and yell at people over. You know, mm-hmm. like uh, there, there are many factors, right? And I know we'll talk about the Trump as a factor, but as you, as you mentioned, abortion, a much bigger factor uh, yep. than, than many thought it would be. I mean, huge. In Pennsylvania, it was the number one issue ahead of inflation. Yep. Big, yep. big issue. Um, yep. And then, you know, I don't know what else was out there that was depressing. Like, like, all the January 6th, the election denialism <clears throat> thing. Like, I'm, I realize that was a factor, but I also want to be wary. I think that, like, I listened to the New York Times Daily the other day, the podcast, and, and it was the New York Times guys saying how it was, this is what did it. It was yeah. election was this, denialism. Was this Nate? Was this Nate, Nate Cohn? Yeah, it was Nate, it was Nate Cohn with Michael mm-hmm. Barbaro. And it was like election denialism. Clearly that's what did it in all these yep. races. I'm like, mm, I don't know. You know, I see, I saw the people with threats to democracy, but I also saw um, there were a lot of Republicans who listed that as their main issue, but they were pointing out the majority of people who said threats to democracy as their issue did vote Dem. So it was probably the Dem version of threats to democracy. But I just, I, I guess I just have trouble believing that, like that people looked at the dark Brandon speech and like independents were thinking, right on? Really? Yeah. I mean, are, are we that out of touch? with how nonpartisans are feeling? Yeah. So I, I think, I, I didn't get through that podcast. I listened to the beginning of it, but I was contemptuous about a month before the election. Nate Cohn wrote a piece about how there's a chance Democrats could hold the House. It's like, that's crazy. <laughs> You're so out of touch, New York <laughs> Times guy. And here we are, you know, the Friday after the election, there's still, you know, it's a slim chance, but there's still a chance. I think it's not, it's not so much that kind of maximalist Liz Cheney, January 6th case. I think there was a, was a broad discomfort with Republicans, not not necessarily oh they're they're a threat to democracy, but just that they they're they're too extreme, they're underprepared, they're scandal plagued, they're chaotic, and this would you know Herschel Walker is not an election denier, right? I mean he um, he said in the debate, which I think he performed quite well in with Warnock, this came up and he's like, yeah, Trump lost, that's why I'm running which I think is a, a really good answer. But then there were deniers like you know, Mastriano who got murdered in Pennsylvania and helped defeat mm-hmm. Oz. And then there's a, a real denier like Lake, you know, who still might win and overperformed, you know, what, what you would have thought after she got nominated. But I just think all these people, there, there's a reason to be un, unsettled about them. And the election was more, again, I can't prove any of this to you with, with the data, but it was usually a midterm where the other side is going to get well, the incumbent party, it's just a pure referendum on them and on mm-hmm. their president. And this was something more on the order of a choice. And, and what they were choosing from a lot of these voters and perhaps especially independents was, 
um, Biden, who we don't like, but Trump, a Trump Republican Party, which we also don't like. And then, hey, Mark Kelly's, uh, you know, an, an interesting guy with a compelling personal story. And and hey, you know, J- John Fetterman, he'll he'll be OK. He's not he's not oh, great. God. But this this uh, we have a weirdo at the top of the ticket. And then a guy who lives in New Jersey uh, in the, the slot for the Senate. So that, that that's that's my guess. And I do, you know, coming around to Trump, I just he he almost invariably chose the, the weakest candidate. And if you're I, I thought there was going to be a wave and that wouldn't matter so much because it would cover the uh, the flaws of, of these candidates. And it turns out it wasn't. And you could go well, down the list. But, if, and, but look, let me you know, take think, you back to yeah. earlier in this process, because I listen to the, the editors and I read everything on yeah. National Review. So I, I've been listening your, to your opinions. But if you recall, it wasn't so long ago, let's say August, certainly, you know, certainly like late July, early August. Nobody believed the GOP was going to get the Senate. Nobody thought that. It was like, mm-hmm. they're looking good for the House. They're going to retake the House. After Dobbs, people weren't like, yeah, the wind at the backs of the Republicans. All those good numbers from the spring fell away, and the numbers looked really good for the Dems. And and then everybody was like, oh, it'd be great if they could take the House. It wasn't until like September, mid-September, that finally people were like, you know what? They're looking good for both houses. So mm-hmm. I, it's not really that shocking to me that things kind of settled back to where they had been mm-hmm. immediately post-Dobbs. Well, this was, this is this is why I think it is a little shocking. So you're absolutely right. August Democrats have a great summer, particularly a good August. I still thought Republicans would would have a good chance of taking the Senate, but it was it was quite uncertain. And and the the confidence about the Senate didn't didn't come around until that August effect faded away. So I mean, you had the initial Bidens in the tank; they're they're going to get killed. Then you have the summer. Wow, Democrats are coming back. And then you had a a snapback to what I thought was reality and the fundamentals and the broader conditions, you know, which is the economy is even more inflation are even more important in the polling than they were uh, before uh, because gas prices are still high and, and, you know, things are shaky. We could experience a recession. And then crime is ascendant as an issue and has overtaken abortion. Abortion's faded a little bit and Democrats are over committing on it. That 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 was like September and October. And it just wasn't yeah. Tuesday. <laughs> Tuesday was more like August. Right. So that, that's why it was such a huge surprise. Well, on the subject of Trump, of course, he's interesting as ever. Um, can't say, take, take, take that away from him. He was all over the news in August, as you know, the Mar-a-Lago raid. Mm-hmm. It dominated the news for about three weeks. And the Republicans' numbers started to go down, you know, with these independents. And when Democrats started to get a little bit more enthusiastic, as they always do when he's in the news. Um, Republicans were mad. I think most Republicans, who, even the non-Trump lovers, were like, this is BS. Like, we're not in support of what's happening at Mar-a-Lago. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but in any event, it seemed to be a net negative for the Republican Party. But then he faded out of the news yep. in a very untrumpy like way. He was quiet, yep. and the news about him was quiet for about yep. a month. And I think that yep. was to the Republicans' advantage. And then he started getting a little loud again. And the Democrats got very loud about him. And we had, you know, Biden out there, like a, a le- de- democracies on the ballot. And they they did sort of remember that it was mm-hmm. better for them if they made it about him. You know, if they tried to make the election about him, as, as you say, instead of a referendum on Joe Biden. And he did seem to be in voters' heads, independents' heads, mm-hmm. if you look at the poll numbers on Tuesday. Yep. It, he he. he came back, you know, he had, you're right, you disappeared. Mar-a-Lago got so complicated legally, <laughs> you know, yeah, it just it it was impossible for anyone to follow him anymore, kind of faded, other things happened. Martha's Vineyard happened. You know, I think that was kind of the yeah, the thing yeah. that the big punctuation mark on the Mar-a-Lago news cycle. And then DeSantis says the, the migrant thing, and, and it, it just shifts and, and we've all forgotten about Mar-a-Lago. And then he comes back, you know, you can't blame him for doing rallies, but I, I think the, the teasing the presidential run and actually having, you know, Hannity the, the other night, was Friday night, I forget, it all, all runs together, you know, th- thought he was literally going to announce, or maybe it, was a, it wasn't over the weekend because it wouldn't have been on, but you know, Friday or something, he's like, he's going to announce, there's going to be a big announcement at this rally, I forget where it was in Pennsylvania, and, and it was only an announcement that he's going to have an announcement, you know, <laughs> ne- next Tuesday, supposedly, but that that wasn't helpful. Where I think Trump is most blameworthy is, is just the candidate selection, and you can go uh, almost all these states there. That are close, like Arizona, Bronovich, the attorney general, if he would have won uh, the nomination, he probably would have won uh, McCormick in Pennsylvania. If he'd beaten Oz, and that was like a 0.1% race, he he would have beaten Fetterman. A congressman would have beaten Warnock rather than, than Herschel. So so Trump has, has his fingerprints all over the, the poor candidate selection, I think. 
Okay. Um, let me read to you from this piece today that was, um, it's by Seamus Brennan. Um, and it's called The Absurdity of the Blame Trump Campaign. It was linked on Real Clear this morning. And he, the, the piece is entitled The Absurdity of the Blame Trump Campaign. And it's interesting to read, you know, an alternate viewpoint. Well, here's what he says. Many Trump candidates, including J.D. Vance, Ted Budd in North Carolina, and almost certainly Kerry Lake and Adam Laxalt, potentially Blake Masters, and possibly after the runoff, Herschel Walker, will have won their races in highly competitive swing, swing stakes, despite be, most of them being outspent by tens of millions of dollars. Where Republican candidates faltered, it was not just those who were chosen by Trump. Numerous strong House candidates handpicked by Kevin McCarthy lost races that the consultant class had expected them to win, including Yesley Vega running against Abigail Spamberger in Virginia, Rhode Island Republican Alan Fung, Myra Flores, Ca Cassie Garcia on the Texas border, and many others. And then um, goes on to point this out, that Trump did, act, did not actually um, endorse some of these candidates until they had already announced. He mm -hmm. says, Trump's endorsement of Doug Mastriano, the disastrous gubernatorial candidate for the GOP in Pennsylvania, did not come until Mastriano had the nomination already yeah. all but secured. He didn't yeah, really sure. push, ma push Mastriano on Pennsylvania primary voters. The same was true in New Hampshire, where Trump did not endorse Don Bolduc until after he had already won the primary. So that's the other side, right? Are we are we being yeah. too hard on Trump? Yeah, I, I think there, there, there's, there are fair and sound points in that. Look, I mean, it was a disappointment up and down the ballot. Um, Democrats did really well in state legislatures, right, where, where we didn't see any of these MAGA versus non-MAGA uh, fights. But you know, the, the, the folks who are at the top of the ticket matter. And, and where, where Trump could choose, he, choose, he chose poorly. Um, and J.D., I think, is, is a bit of an exception because he was the, the MAGA candidate who was uh, uh, really one of Trump's endorsement, who was actually the, the best candidate in that field, at least among mm -hmm. the, the, um, the, the other potential alternatives. Josh Mandel was just terrible, just absolutely terrible. And then there was a businessman who's briefly winning, uh, um, running ahead. It was also terrible. And you've looked Where? at the debate, you, you think, oh, Ohio? J.D.'s the normal one, you know, because he's good, mm -hmm. he's rational, he knows what he's talking about. So that that was a, that was an exception. But it's it's true. The, the other was, thing it, is, it was, if I can just spend one yeah. second on J.D., he, he, like, I've spent a lot of time with him. I did a long piece on him uh, for NBC. I interviewed all of his family members, was out there with him in Ohio, with, um, he and his wife, and so on. He, his story is so compelling. Hillbilly Elegy is a must read. It will it will break your heart. It will make you cry. It will make you stand and cheer for him. The amount of stuff that that guy's overcome in his life to wind up at Yale Law School, to wind up with working for Peter Thiel, to go back to Ohio, to back to his home, try to help his local community. I know he had to say Trumpy like things to get the you know the primary through the primary and so on. But like my impression way over here is J D Vance is a good man. He's had a lot of struggles in his life, and he did what he needed to do to get elected, and it alienated yeah. some people. But I, I think you, anybody who spends a long time looking at J.D. Vance sees a good person. I really do. Yeah. So this this is uh, what I want to pick up on, on from, from that uh, pull thread is he did what he needed to, to do to win that nomination. And, and I have a lot of time for that. I mean, you're an ambitious person. You think there's a good reason for you to be in the Senate. You're going to do good things with it. And Donald Trump, you know, the endorsement of one man can make the difference whether you're there or not. You're going to try right. to get the endorsement of that one man, right? And almost everyone yeah. tried to do it, right? E even yeah. the more non-mega candidates, like, you know, Pennsylvania, David McCormick was, was trying to get it. But this is where I think the biggest problem comes with, with Trump. And it's certainly true is that that piece picked up by RCP notes, you know, Mastriano was going to win one way or the other. Baldock was going to win one way or the other. And Trump kind of came in, was, was getting on the train late. But he created this environment where um, uh, people are really ginned up about the election, um, where stop the steal is sort of a, a matter of uh, um, whether you believe it or not, it makes you, you know, a heretic if you don't believe it. Um, That's right. He, he, he did that. And if he hadn't told untruths about the election, if he weren't obsessed about it, you'd have a primary electorate that was less of those things as well. So he's, he's created, I think, an unhealthy environment for the party in general. Well, I heard and you I, and talking I about broader and deeper case I heard case. you talking about a step before that, and I've read this elsewhere too, where in a, in a way Trump kind of chased a lot of 
I don't know what you're going to call them, normal Republicans. They're, they're not really establishment, or whatever, mainstream Republicans out of running in the in the first place. Like there were some right. obvious next choices for Senate in places like Pennsylvania, like Arizona, like Georgia. And a lot of these like really beloved Republicans who could have run were like, I'm out of here. I'm not yeah. doing it. I know I'm not ready to kiss the ring. And I know exactly what that's going to mean for me. Yeah. So like a great example, Doug Ducey in Arizona, successful two term governor, one one by double digits, his his reelection would have won in the Senate in a run. I mean, it, it wouldn't even be an issue. You could put that one in the Republican column and didn't run because he's um, he's been governor. He, he's not going to grovel in front of, you know, to Trump. In fact, you know, he had this contention with Trump over uh, certifying the election. So it's just not going to do it. It's just not. So so your first tier guy. He's not even consideration. So then you get get an argument over second tier guys. You know, is Bronovich better or is Blake Masters better? I would argue Bronovich is better. So I would kind of characterize Masters as, as the third tier in that race. And that's the guy Trump puts over the top. Um, and, and that that was true in, in a lot of other states. Pat Toomey, you know, he'd been he's been in Congress and, and the Senate for a while now. Maybe just time for him to do something else personally. He, he would have left regardless. You know, but he had counties in Pennsylvania, um, re- Republican county groups denouncing him, you know, in resolutions. Um, if, if he had any inkling that he was going to run again, he had to worry about whether he's going to win a win a nomination. And and again, he just wouldn't have been an, an issue. I mean, he would have had a five point race or something, um, but he would have stopped Fetterman. So, again, I just think Trump, he he won in 2016 against a lot of expectations, including mine. He did a lot of good things three Supreme Court justices other things. Then he lost a winnable race in, in 2022. And then and then he took the party down a rabbit hole um, that led nowhere, led to lots of futility, led to actual bloodshed, bloodshed on January 6th. And it's just time for the, the party should just say they don't need to be a never Trumper. They don't need to you know have my view of them. They just say, no, thanks, sir. You know, you did a lot. We appreciate it. Now we're going to build on what you did, you know, with, with someone else. That would seem to me, the, you know, the rational alternative. It seemed to me so since November 2020, but you know, uh, I, I, I've been wrong a lot, and things that I thought <laughs> made make sense turned out not to make sense and not to happen. So we'll see. Mm, well, it, it really is. It's like you fall into a relationship with, some, with somebody, you get married, you actually have kids, and then things get really toxic, and you realize this is no longer good for me. It doesn't mean it wasn't good. You know, you got mm-hmm. your three beautiful children. Right. You're, you're not right, right. sorry about the union and how well it worked out, but. In many relationships, there comes a time when you realize it really is time to move on. And that's what a lot of the Republican Party is saying. Now, even, even party faithful to Donald Trump are saying that. Can we talk for a minute about McConnell? Because some yeah. of Trump's defenders, again, we're going to have one on the program in just a little bit, Rick Grinnell, who I love. Um, but a lot of Trump's defenders are like, can you, we just stop blaming Trump, who, who worked very hard to get a lot of these people elected, who know he did not tap into his $100 million war chest, but he raised a ton of money for the yeah. candidates who ran and won uh, this past cycle. And he did tons of rallies, and he gave of himself, and he's not a young man, and he was out there working it. And Mitch McConnell sat over there in the Senate, and rather than being helpful to a lot of these people, just was like, ugh, candidate quality. And they felt that undermined candidates like Blake Mas- uh, Masters and uh, maybe J.D. Vance, too. And, you know, we could go down the list, Oz in Pennsylvania. And that he also spent $9 million uh, in Alaska, where Lisa mm-hmm. Murkowski didn't get the Republican primary nomination. So she ran, mm-hmm. just ran it as an yeah. independent. And uh, they, and the more Trumpy Republican running out there was not to McConnell's liking. So he spent yep. all this money to help get uh, Lisa Murkowski reelected, who, you know, hit, Trump Trump fans might call her a rhino. Uh, I mean, she's obviously much more of a squish than like a Ted Cruz. Yep. Uh, and they're mad. Well, so, like, they're well, saying, so, why would right, he spend that her. money on Blake Masters or on, mm-hmm. on Adam Laxalt? You know, races yep. that we knew this the whole thing was going to come down to. Yeah. So no one's judgment is flawless. And, you know, McConnell, the, the, the uh, problem there, overly conventional, right? And uh, overly concerned with protecting incumbents, no matter what, you know, that accounts for the million spent on Lisa Murkowski. But that said, I mean, he, he raised, I, I think it's you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Literally, it might, might be the most money raised by any person or entity in a, in a midterm ever, I believe. And there's some choices that I wondered about at the time. I was told about an internal poll that had Baldick, turn out, turns out it was a BS poll, but that had Baldick down like two, you know, two weeks before the election. 
And the very same day, McConnell's SLF, his group, pulled out of New Hampshire. Why are they doing that? You know, is it just out of spite? Right. Is it just out of bad judgment? It turned out it was the right call, right? Because they weren't going to win New Hampshire. And that was plowed into Pennsylvania, where well, how you do know, you know? It was close. chicken egg. Uh, well, how do you know? Maybe if you take that nine million that he gave in the Alaska race and gave it to Bolduc, New Hampshire would have been tighter, or he would have won. Yeah, I mean, I just don't think nothing was saving Bolduc if he was losing by ten. Blake Masters yeah. might might have been more spite, you know, because JD was critical of the establishment, but then you know took called Mitch McConnell, talked to Mitch McConnell. Uh, Masters didn't play that game, so I, I think you can you can say that was spiteful. Um, they they sh- still should have been in Arizona. But, you know, they still spent massive money on all of these candidates, including J.D. You know, I don't know what the SLF contribution specifically was in Ohio, but there's $30 million spent on J.D.'s behalf from the established from establishment type groups that he, yeah. you know, was, was uh, excoriating. Um, and uh, if 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 J.D. had been stronger at the outset, you could spend that money, you know, maybe spend some of that on on Baldock. But they, they needed mm. the, the way the, the way like a establishment figure like McConnell thinks we want certainty for a majority. That's what we want. If we're going to spend a hundred million dollars and know that we uh, can get 51, we're going to do that rather than raising, you know, 140 million sprinkling around on kind of stretch seats. So that, that mindset could be flawed. It's not necessarily right in every circumstance, but that's, that's what they're thinking. Um, So yeah, you can, you can ding McConnell on various things, but I, I don't, in terms of the overall environment that hurt Republicans, Trump, although not wholly responsible for it by any means, he's certainly, in my view, more responsible for it than McConnell was. The independents uh, who were not absolutely 100 percent disgusted with Biden, the ones who were like, I'm mildly displeased with that guy, voted for Republicans. Um, and But they didn't vote for the Trump Republicans. And that's I'll get to that in a minute, but that was a that was a critical problem for the GOP. They needed to get the, all the people who were dissatisfied with Biden to vote Republican up and down the line. And those were the ticket splitters who were like, mm, nope, I'll go for like the ones who seem normal to me. But the, the ones who are Trump adjacent, that's a bridge too far. Stand by mm-hmm. more with Rich Lowry right after this. Don't go away. Like many folks, I am eating healthier these days, trying to. And that is why I love some good olive oil. And by good, I mean fresh olive oil olive oil (laughs) packs the most flavor and the healthiest nutrients when it's fresh from the farm. And that is the problem with supermarket oils, whether whether you know it or not. They're not fresh. That olive oil has been sitting there for a long time, many months in some cases, growing stale. That's why I like my olive oil direct from small award-winning farms, thanks to a guy named TJ Robinson, also known as the olive oil hunter. When I first tasted TJ's farm fresh oils, I was like, what is this? It's going to taste like every other olive oil. No, no, all contraire. I really did fall fall in love with the vibrant flavors. It's delicious. You can taste the difference. They are delicious on salads, veggies, pasta, meat, fish, you name it. As an introduction to his fresh pressed olive oil club, TJ's willing to send you a full size bottle worth 39 bucks of one of the world's finest artisanal olive oils for just one little dollar, which will help him cover the shipping. Best of all, there's never a commitment to buy anything. You can cancel your membership at any time. Get your free $39 bottle for just one little dollar shipping and taste the difference freshness makes. Go to harvestfreshnow.com, harvestfreshnow.com for a free bottle and pay just that little itty bitty dollar for the shipping, harvestfreshnow.com. Rich, um, okay, let's talk about... Trump and DeSantis and the Trump tweets that are coming out, like, I can't even keep track of them. They're coming out so fast and furiously right now. Like, he's on, a, I call it a tweet, but it's a, it's a quote, truth. It's a truth. Uh, he can't stop himself. I'm trying to get him in front of me. I don't know where they went, but he's, okay. Okay. First, he's going off on the Murdochs and all Murdoch-owned companies. I'll just give you a flavor. I know you've heard it, but our audience may not have. News Corp, which is Fox, the Wall Street Journal, and the no longer great New York Post, is all in for Governor Ron DeSanctimonious, an average Republican governor with great public relations, who didn't have to close up his state, but did, unlike other Republican governors whose overall numbers for a Republican were just average, middle of the pack, including COVID, and who has the advantage of sunshine, where people from badly run states up north would go no matter who the governor was, just like I did. Then a long paragraph, which I'll spare you, but it's basically saying that Ron came to him and bent the knee to get Trump's help when he was running for Congress in 2017. 
Um, he was politically dead, losing in a landscape to a very good agriculture commissioner, Adam Putnam, who was loaded with cash and great poll numbers. Ron had low approval, bad polls, and no money. But he said if I would endorse him, he could win. Then goes on to explain how that's exactly what happened. And then I fixed his campaign uh, when he was running for uh, governor, which had completely fallen apart. I stopped his election from being stolen. <laughs> and now— and now Ron DeSanctimonious is playing games. The fake news asks him if he's going to run if President Trump runs, and he says, I'm only focused on the governor's race. I'm not looking into the future. Well, in terms of loyalty and class, that's not really the right answer. <laughs> it's kind of amusing. You've got to give him points for being amusing. Um, and then basically just says, you know, make America great again, me, 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 me. So far as we know, he's going full steam ahead with his announcement on Tuesday, right? Tuesday the 15th. Is Tuesday the 15th? Yeah, yeah, Tuesday the 15th. Which, knowing Trump, maybe it's not even an election announcement. Maybe it's just some big tease about how he's going to do another benefit for, vet for veterans or something. <laughs> I have no idea. He hasn't specifically said what this, what the topic is. But what are we to make of the nonstop <laughs> tweeting? He attacked Governor Youngkin as yeah. well today. He said his name sounds Chinese. I mean, I can't. I can't. Yeah. That, that happened. Yeah, that one was bar bizarre. I don't know whether it was a typo where, you know, your phone fix, fixes something and it came out young space kin. And then he's like, oh, that's funny. <laughs> I'll, I'll make a Chinese joke or, or, or whether he did it deliberately. <laughs> Who knows? So he's, he's obviously, you know, not in a great state. He's He's angry. Um, the, the, the truth about DeSantis is both obviously a warning that, uh, Trump will do everything possible to destroy him if he gets in the race and will throw out, you know, as, as, as is Trump's want. And that's worked for him over the years, just tons of allegations, uh, some of which fabricated. I mean, the idea he sent the FBI down to, to stop, uh, the election from being stolen from DeSantis is crazy, but, DeSantis eventually, you will know, have to address it. I mean, he doesn't have to address it now. I just say, well, I need to be inaugurated. I'm focused on, um, you know, our, our agenda and the, the next term of the legislature, next session of the legislature or whatever. But eventually, if he gets in, this is what it'll be. It'll be a hail of fist uh, from Trump and he'll, he'll uh, have to figure out how, how to deal with it. But it, it's at the same time, it's a warning of what's to come. At, it's also a sign of weakness, right? This is not, this is someone who's afraid, right? Um, and and, and is, is eager to keep DeSantis out because he's afraid it will happen clearly if he gets in. And at this juncture in nomination battles, very often everything we think is wrong, right? We think, oh, it's going to be Trump, DeSantis. You know, who knows? It ended up being Young, Pomp Young and Pompeo for all we know. But, oh, but wow. um, DeSantis, his stature in the party grew a huge way on Tuesday night, you know, winning by 20 points was amazing enough. Then to do it when everyone else is, is uh, losing, just puts it in stark relief. I was talking to a Republican Senator, um, the same one who was trying to convince me about Nevada and just saying his state, clearly if you took a poll now, DeSantis for 2024, DeSantis would be 20 points higher than he was on Monday. Uh, so Trump mm -hmm. knows that Trump feels that, feels that, and he's trying to grapple with it. I mean, the thing about DeSantis is he hasn't yet been, really tested in the way we've seen yep. Trump tested, right? He hasn't, we haven't seen oh, him on a big debate stage. I mean, it's Charlie Crist, please. I mean, my yep. plant could beat him in a debate. Um, yep. So, you know, I feel like DeSantis is far less tested than Trump has been in terms of, you know what you're getting when you get Donald Trump. So I don't know, like, I don't know what to expect. I, I don't know DeSantis enough. I, I have to yep. be honest, like, I feel a little uncomfortable with how sycophantic Everyone on the right wing is sounding about him. Can, can we like just wait and let him? Yeah. Let's see more, you know? Like, my God, even the press is like sending out their selfies of their picture with him. I'm like, could you just at least pretend that there's an arm's length there? I just, it's making me a little uncomfortable. Yeah. I, I, I just literally, as I was, uh, I, I flew down to, to Florida today just because of the sunshine. Not, nothing to do with the sand. That's just it. the sunshine. <laughs> but uh, I, I checked my email and I got the plane. An old gray beard who's been around National Review for decades emailed me. He's like, Trump, you know, what he's done is unforgivable. But counseling you, Rich, don't jump all in on DeSantis yet. Let it play out. And so I, it's yeah. exactly the same point. Just the jump from, even though DeSantis has a major national profile now, the jump from performing on a state stage to a national stage is huge. It's huge. And yeah. performing is, you underline that word, right? Trump won in 16 because he was such a fantastic performer. Obama, mm -hmm. same thing. You know, a performer. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to light people up. 
the only exception is Biden, and that was uh, unusual <laughs> circumstances. Uh, otherwise, <laughs> big you need that, that, Yeah, you need the, the charisma, and DeSantis is naturally an introverted man, and um, uh, you know he's obviously succeeded, succeeded hugely despite that, which is not a natural quality, uh, quality for a politician. But it'll be tested. It'll be tested in a way. It just does it to everyone. The uh, presidential mm-hmm. politics, the pressure cooker, it exposes you. And whatever his flaws are, and he has has some that we're aware of, some we're not aware of, we will learn. That's that's the way it always works. This is the debate we've been having on an ongoing basis uh, on whether DeSantis or any other man or woman can get past the 800-pound gorilla. You know, can if the gorilla says, I'm in on Tuesday, see if you can get by me, can anyone? And let's say DeSantis does. Let's say there are enough angry MAGA core faithful out there like, you know, I love Trump, but I, I like winning more. And I think DeSantis is going to get us, you know, to the promised land. Aren't there enough par- like Trump faithful who could be spoilers, who will yeah. ruin the whole thing? These are big questions. So I, I've, I've tended, you know, followed what you've said about um, Trump's strength in the primary and I tend to agree with it. But I think now, you know, he's 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 less of a grill and more of an orangutan. Orangutans are still big creatures. They have enormous, strong arms. They can hurt you. You don't want to get in a fight with an orangutan, but it's, it's a little yeah. less for, formidable than, than a gorilla. So I think Trump is diminished, um, at least for now. I thought he's been diminished before, and he's always bounced right back. So maybe he bounced right back after this one, too. But I, this does feel, um, feel, feel different. So, But I don't discount Trump at all. And you know, we've heard from the elites you know, we've heard some from opinion makers. We've heard some from some more elected politicians than I, I would have thought. Uh, Winsome Sears down in uh, Lieutenant Governor yeah, saw that. in Virginia said, you know, just the other day, she's not going to support him. <clears throat> um, but we haven't heard from the voters yet. We haven't even seen polling. And they're the they're the ones who drove the Trump phenomenon fundamentally in 16. They're the ones that have made every single Republican afraid of Trump. It's not Trump so much, mm. although obviously, as we're seeing with the stances, he'll throw anything at you. But it's it's the fear of what the voters will do to you if you're on the wrong side of Trump, and that that feels mm-hmm. fear still there for understandable reasons. So we don't know how the voters are, are processing all this. Yeah, we're taking calls every day, and it's, it's obviously just very anecdotal. But it's fascinating to listen to even Trump diehards calling in saying, "I'm ready for new blood," mm-hmm. and I'm mad about what was done in in the, this election. But mm-hmm. then also Trump faithful saying it's not DeSantis's turn. You know, it's just not his yeah. turn. He needs to wait. The only reason he exists politically is because of Trump and kind of agreeing with Trump. You know, that's kind of rude or however he put it in that piece. It's not the night. That is not the right answer, as Trump said. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> not a classy right, let's, answer let's, from DeSantis, that's, that's for sure. Let's switch over to Biden for a minute because um, yeah. he gave another press conference the other day. I mean, it was just like he was flubbing his words. He was saying that, uh, that the, the Russians were pulling out of Fallujah. <laughs> I was like, no, no. Um, okay, fine. He's our president. We also have uh, Senator Fetterman, just in case in case you were keeping track. Oh, here's a moment of levity. This is what we need right now, Rich, before you go on your cruise. I'll tell the viewers about that in a second. Kamala Harris reacts to the big win as follows. Sot three. <laughs> you did it, Joe. <laughs> Couldn't help myself. Oh, my God. Good luck with that, Democrats. Good luck with that. Because I know that everybody's like, okay, now Joe Biden is not going to withdraw. Now he's got a runway for a second election here as president. But really, because he's not getting any younger. And the word search and all that, it's not getting any better. And that's what's waiting in the wings. Yeah. Look, I think his his, uh, desire to do it has gone up, right? Um, he dodged a bullet, he's exhilarated, but the fundamentals are still there. I, it, would, it would be so reckless just for their own political purposes for Democrats to nominate him, I believe. Now, part of it, they, they're looking at Kamala, like, oh, okay, maybe, Joe, maybe Joe's looking more vigorous than we thought. But mm-hmm. he could have a terrible fall or something in the midst of a general election campaign. He could die in the midst of a general election campaign. And then the idea that he's going to do this President of the United States until age 86, it's crazy. It's crazy. And it would be terrible for the country, terrible for Joe and his family, but terrible for the country if something happens to him. You know, we have a president die in office. It's it's just, 
it's wrong. He shouldn't do it. I still believe my, my odds of him running have gone up after <clears throat> Tuesday night because I thought, you know, if they got shellacked Wednesday morning, everyone would be saying, you know, me, every Democrat, you know, me, it just looks so great. Maybe it's time for, for new blood. They're not saying that now, but the, but he's still a really old guy. And I just think when, when they sit down, Jill and Joe and whoever else is really in the circle, they're going to say, this is not, you're not up for it. You, you shouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. That, that's still my belief, but we'll see. I mean, it gets more precarious every day. I realize politically he's been shorn up, but again, cognitively, he hasn't. Mm-hmm. Here's just an example of what we saw the other day, SOT 8. You know, I just, I just found it interesting that uh, Biden's being a popular, a, 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 a cop, Biden's being an extremist. Oh, God. There were a couple moments there where you can see the interpreter, like the sign language woman on the side, frozen. Like, I got nothing. Yeah. I, anyone? Anyone? That's going to be the next four years if he gets reelected. Yeah, and and we talked about this before. You're you're ahead of the curve, being willing to to talk about this. <clears throat> um, forgetting is not forgetting names, stumbling on your words. That age, not concerning. It's the confusion. It's the confusion, and I would say the gait, you know, the way he walks, that that are really concerning and a sign some, something else is going on besides just aging. Who knows? You know, we we should resist. Um, a diagnosis from from afar, but not knowing, you know, congressman passed away, confusing how his own son, you know, a Siri experience, right? It's not something you mess up. Uh, how, how his son, how, how and where his son passed away. Those are really bad signs, really Saying bad Saying he got the student loan, quote, forgiveness yeah. passed by two votes, something yeah. he did by executive fiat, which never was subjected to a vote. And by the way, it's just been overturned by a court. Like yeah. that- that's something you really should remember. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. And again, it's, it's just, just confusion. Well, what about the Democrats? Because one of the things he was asked was, what are you going to do differently? Mm-hmm. I understand you had a good day, but 70% of the country is unhappy with the direction. And many, the vast majority are angry over the situation they've been placed in economically. So um, what, what are you going to do differently? And he literally said nothing. Nothing. You're just going to sit back and enjoy the effects of my policies thus far, and then you're all going to come over. So, I mean, if that's true, what does that portend for 2024? Yeah, I mean, they, they're really the, the um, we were talking about this the other day on our podcast, the editors, potentially, I mean, this is a big disappointment for Republicans. It's a shame to leave seats on the table. But if Republicans take a lesson that we need to be serious about governing, we need to have an agenda, we need to be more normal. I don't necessarily like like that that word, but seem less threatening to, uh, uh, to and less unsteady to voters. If Republicans really take that lesson on board and act on it, you know, that something would have got good would have come from this this disappointment. Whereas the Democrats, who are deeply unpopular and sort of threaded the needle and managed to to, to uh, dodge a bullet this time, are going to learn nothing from it. And and uh, even if it had been a shellacking, I'm not sure what they would have learned from it. They're so fixed now. And their ideological beliefs on on the border. I mean, they basically just believe it, anyone who's an asylum seeker, no matter how bogus, should be able to come to the country and stay. Right? I mean, that that that's what they believe. Um, the uh, a climate, you know, it's a climate emergency, so it doesn't matter what how high gas prices are. You know, we'll kind of flail around a little bit with the strategic reserve and lobbying the size, but otherwise, we're not we're not doing any of our own uh, drilling. They're not going to change on that. And they, you know, he'll be forced to change somewhat if Republicans take the House on spending. But they're they're just dead set on that, and and they'll be probably be woker in twenty four than they are now, uh, just because that's a natural progression, and they've learned no lessons. Even though the exit poll showed fifty percent of the voters <coughs> said we do not like the direction we are going on this trans education sort of social uh, engineering stuff, and only twenty two percent said we we like the direction. So. Ignore them, too, at your own peril. I got to mm-hmm. run, Rich. You're going on the National Review Cruise. Yeah. That's a tough ticket to get. I, I uh, One of these years, I'll join you guys, and it'll be super fun. Thanks, Megan. All right. Enjoy the Caribbean. Uh, coming up, one bright spot for the GOP, Mike Lawler, the guy who knocked out the head of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. That guy was so worried about getting other Democrats elected, he forgot to think of himself. Well, the new Republican congressman from Rockland County is here next. Do you ever wonder if your vitamins are working? Clinical studies show Healthy Cell's new ingestible gel technology called Microgel delivers maximum nutrient absorption, 165% more than tablets. And it tastes great. 
It's hard to make vitamin liquids or gels taste good naturally, right? But Healthy Cell products are the best tasting pill-free supplements on the market. Go pill-free and get up to 15 pills worth of nutrients in one ultra-absorption gel pack, saving you money and time and giving you effective doses. Take a single great tasting gel pack at home or on the go. It's great for travel. And you can mix it into drinks or blend it into smoothies. Old-fashioned tablets, capsules, and powders contain synthetic other ingredients like binding glues, flow agents, fillers, coatings that could irritate your gut and are just kind of gross. Plus, this is made in the USA. Visit HealthyCell.com slash Megan, M-E-G-Y-N, or use that code Megan for 20% off your first order. In one of the biggest victories for the Republicans this week, New York State Assemblyman Mike Lawler unseated Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee Chairman Sean Patrick Maloney. Mike joins me now. And by the way, later, we're going to take your calls again. Please get on the line. I'd love to hear from you on Trump, DeSantis, McConnell, and more. Who do you think is to blame for the disappointing results compared to what people were expecting? If the GOP wins the House, and certainly if they manage to eke out the Senate, it will be considered a victory by most on Team Red. But I'd love to know your thoughts, so call me, 833-44-MEGYN. That's 833-446-3496. Congressman Mike Lawler, welcome. Thanks for having me, Megan. How are you? Yes, Congressman elect. Um, I'm great. I'm great. I'm so happy for you because I love Rockland County. I come from a long line of people from Rockland County. My Nana was raised in Rockland County. She lived in Tepan. I know you're uh, in Pearl Rivers right there. We used to go all the time. I went to Piermont every summer growing up. Um, and so, you know, had I remained in that region, you would be my new congressman. That's it. It's a, it's a great community. Uh, I've born and raised here. My family's been here over 100 years. Uh, I love Rockland County. It's a it's a great place. So what are you doing turning it red? How how did you achieve the unachievable in New York State? Well, I think there were a number of factors here. Uh, first and foremost, the redistricting process itself. Uh, back in January of this year, Sean Patrick Maloney, in his role as chair of the DCCC, sent a memo to state Democrats demanding that they gerrymander New York's congressional districts. Uh, and they did. And ultimately, a Democrat-appointed Court of Appeals uh, ruled that it was unconstitutional and gerrymandered and threw them out, and then appointed a special master who drew a fair set of maps. And as we saw on Tuesday, we picked up four seats, uh, bringing our total to 11 Republicans uh, going down to Washington come January. So you know, I think redistricting uh, played a, a major factor. On top of that, when the new map came out, Sean Patrick Maloney uh, decided, rather than running in uh, the 18th, which he currently represents, that he would run in the 17th, uh, in part because he lives in Putnam County and Putnam County got brought into the 17th. The problem was 75 percent of his current district uh, is in the newly drawn 18th. So he only represented about 25 percent of the newly drawn 17th district. And he pushed Mondaire Jones, the first openly gay black man, out of Congress to do it. And I think that did not go over well uh, with Mm. many Democrats and progressives uh, in the district. And I was coming out of Rockland, which is 42 percent of the newly drawn district. So I had a a pretty good base of support in Rockland County. um, And I represent 20 percent of the district in the state assembly currently. So he didn't have that kind of built-in advantage. On top of that, then you look at the issues and what was going on. Democrats control everything in Washington, Albany, and New York City for the first time ever in our nation's history. And they created an absolute mess, a 41-year record high on inflation, surging crime, skyrocketing energy prices, a porous southern border, parents being labeled domestic terrorists for daring to ask questions about their children's education. And I think voters across this district, especially, uh, were very frustrated and wanted to see balance and common sense restored at every level of government. And so I think that played a, a major role as well. And then finally, in his capacity as chair of the DCCC, frankly, he wasn't paying attention to the district. Uh, he was gallivanting around the globe. He, he was raising money in Paris and London and Geneva 
as recently as a month ago for Nancy Pelosi. Uh, while I was out doing six, seven, eight events a day for six months and pounding the pavement, talking to voters, uh, and I think it paid dividends on Election Day. Hmm. Now, what happened? Why didn't the, you know, a lot of the Trump detractors say, if you were Trump adjacent, you got wiped out. Like if you were Trumpy, you got wiped out. We've talked about in our first segment how that may or may not be totally true. Um, why, why, like, do you feel like that didn't affect you at all? And I don't know whether you are Trump or Jason. I know you've said it's time for him to move on. But do you feel like you avoided that? Uh, well, you know, uh, Maloney was tagging me as MAGA Mike and too extreme for the Hudson Valley. Uh, but anybody who's talked to me for five seconds realizes uh, that's not how I am or, or who I am. And And I think, you know, for me, I won a two to one Democratic district two years ago. And I did that by going into every community, uh, talking to voters, regardless of their race, their ethnicity, their gender, their religion, or their political persuasion. And I did the same thing here. And I think for me, that uh, played uh, well because uh, voters were very upset about what was going on. And it wasn't so much about being a Republican or a Democrat. Um, I ignored the attacks that that Maloney was, uh, you know, running against me. He was lying about my position on abortion. He was lying about uh, a number of things. And I just kept heavily focused on the issues that voters were concerned about, which was primarily inflation, the cost of living and crime um, and just hammered away on it. And I think that obviously ultimately uh, prevailed because that's where voters were focused on. And I think part so, of this, as, as we move forward as a party, um, yeah. candidate recruitment matters, uh, but also message discipline matters and not getting into, uh, frankly, issues that voters either don't care about or are less likely to get their vote. How big a factor do you think this so-called election denialism was in the national races? Well, I think it I think it hurts uh, any candidate that's engaged in it because I mean, unfortunately, it's just not based in reality. And, uh, you know, I I was asked very uh, clearly, did Joe Biden win? And I said, yes. And was January 6th wrong? Yes. And I think, you know, that immediately ended that conversation with anybody who Mm -hmm. had a concern because I was not trying to hem and haw about it. Um, So, Mm -hmm. you know, I think as we move forward, we got to move beyond uh, some of this this rhetoric. there's no question when you when you talk about election laws, uh, you want to make sure they're fair. You want to make sure that they are enforced uh, to the letter of the law. But to to just make blanket statements that the uh, the election was stolen or fraudulent, I, I don't think serves anyone well. Um, and I think for those that engaged in that, uh, I think it backfires. So one more question on Trump, and then I want to talk about Hochul. Uh what do you think about him? I mean, uh, he's clearly making an announcement next week that sounds like a presidential announcement. He's tweeting out or truthing out right now um, messages that he's the best candidate, retweeting people who are saying he's the one who should run, he should be the next president. I mean, very clearly, he's in a lane right now. Uh, should he run again? Look, he's going to make that decision and uh, nobody else is going to tell him uh, whether he can or can't run, um, obviously. And and ultimately, uh, should he run, voters are going to make the final determination. But I think, um, you know, so many of the policies that he enacted uh, are embraced by Republicans. And and he had a lot of accomplishments during his administration. And I think what is unfortunate is that rather than focus on those accomplishments and the record, uh, a lot of time has been squandered, uh, you know, uh, talking about the past or talking about uh, what is uh, perceived slights. And, and and I just don't see how that serves uh, him well. I don't see how it serves the country well or the party well. And I, and I think, should he run, he really should be focused on the future and he should be focused on uh, what he's going to do to fix the challenges uh, that we're facing. Uh, me personally, I would like to see new voices uh, kind of step up. I think we have some uh, great rising stars in the party. Obviously, Governor DeSantis had a, a, a great night on Tuesday night. Um, but I think in in any election, it's about the future. It's about what you can do uh, to help families and to help the voters 
uh, address the challenges that they're facing. And and that's in p- large part why I won, because I stayed so focused on that and didn't get caught up in some of this other nonsense that goes on. Help us understand, a lot of my mom friends in New York City who went through the lockdowns and didn't have their children in school for over a year, and then finally they went back to masks, I mean, long past the point where any, but any serious person thought that worked. And they're frustrated. And these are lifelong Democrats who voted red in this election. I'm sure you know a lot of these people. They don't understand how Kathy Hochul got reelected. They don't understand why here we are on the Friday after the midterms and we're getting video of Governor Hochul with Randy Weingarten visiting Puerto Rico with a bunch of children behind them still masked up. Hold on, I'll just show it to the YouTube audience here because it's it, infuri- it makes makes my blood boil. Here it is. Oh, they're having such a good time. There she is clapping, and every child has got a mask on their face, and she doesn't, and the other adults don't either. And no one wanted to see this. No one wanted to see her laughing and cheering and clapping with her without a mask on, with the children still. It's not New York, but still, but still masked up. It's so unnecessary. How how'd she do that? It's it's really sad. Uh, she she is one of the most incompetent people I've ever seen uh, in any elected position. Um, and obviously, you know, she walked into it because Governor Cuomo imploded uh, because of all of his conduct and uh, especially surrounding the nursing home uh, crisis here in New York. Uh, it, it's sad because Lee Zeldin uh, really would have tackled the challenges that New Yorkers were dealing with, which is primarily affordability. Uh, and crime. And she still refuses to do anything uh, to address the scourge of crime in New York City. Uh, The fact that she has not called us back for a special session to repeal cashless bail, to uh, ensure judges do have discretion, to uh, create a dangerousness standard, speaks volumes to what her priorities are. No, Mm -hmm. she would rather fly down to Puerto Rico and dance in the streets with children being masked uh, right next to her. Uh, It Mm -hmm. it just shows you how out of touch she is, how incompetent she is. Um, And unfortunately, in New York City, where they are most impacted by these really bad policies, uh, they voted to reelect her once again. And it, and it's it's very frustrating. I you know, I, I previously served as executive director of the state Republican Party. I ran Rob Astorino's campaign for governor in 2014 against Andrew Cuomo. Uh, We were outspent seven to one, and yet Rob defeated uh, Cuomo 49 to 46 outside the city of New York. Rob got Mm. 18% of the vote in New York City. Lee Zeldin got over 30% of the vote in New York City um, and and won uh, the rest of the state uh, pretty pretty convincingly. Unfortunately, uh, you know, a lot of Democrats came out in New York City and voted to continue this disastrous uh, set of policies that it's have really destroyed our state. It's a very far left city and getting more far left by the second as people of reason move out in droves. It went 87 percent for Joe Biden in the presidential election. So the fact that Zeldin got 30 percent really says something about how at least some people there are feeling. Meanwhile, in your district, so you this is an embarrassing loss for the Democrats. This one, it's embarrassing. Um, this is a district that Biden won by 10 points in 2020 that now you just turned red. And your opponent, uh, Maloney, is talking about his loss. And he, I think, was gracious in conceding you won fair and square. Um, but kind of took a shot at AOC, which was interesting. He said, um, she's also a New York congresswoman, she represents a different district. She said, I didn't see, he said, I didn't see her one minute of these midterms helping our House majority. She's an important voice in our politics, but he continued, but when it comes to passing our agenda through the Congress or standing our ground on the political battlefield, she was nowhere to be found. What do you make of that? She's fought back saying, he courted me for donations and swing races, and it was the first thing I did this term, over a quarter million for Dems' cycle. DCCC facilitated some, and now he denies it. If he's not aware of my visit to CA and and efforts we put in, that's on him. And she goes on, as for him not seeing me, perhaps it's because as a party leader, he chose not to see or value prominent members of his party for years. And she goes on. (laughs) Uh, listen, the uh, the infighting begins. Um, 
Look, at the end of the day, honestly, he has nobody to blame but himself. I mean, he he uh, was in part responsible for the redistricting fiasco with his memo that was Exhibit A in the lawsuit uh, that overturned uh, the Democrat-drawn maps. He moved into a district that he only represented 25 percent of, um, and he really did not campaign until the final three weeks. You know, this district is home to Bill and Hillary Clinton and George Soros. And uh, in the final three weeks, he had Bill Clinton come and campaign for him. He had Jill Biden come in. He had Hillary Clinton send an email out for him. Uh, He had Joe Biden make phone calls into the Orthodox Jewish community uh, to try and sway votes. Uh, Oh, yeah. He scrambled and he lost and he lost because he was out of touch. I mean, at the end of the campaign, he told voters uh, that, you know, his plan to deal with inflation was that they should go uh, eat Chef Boyardee. I mean, it was comical uh, wow. if it wasn't so sad. So I think, you know, he can point the finger at Kathy Hochul. He can point the finger at AOC. But frankly, I think voters were tired of his shtick. Mike Lawler, it's going to be fascinating to watch you and your fellow newly elected Republicans as you head down to Washington. All the best to you. Thanks, Megan. Our next guest is Rick Grinnell. We're going to bring him in in one second. He was, of course, acting director of national intelligence under the Trump administration. But we're going to begin this hour or this block, I should say, with your calls. Uh, I can see the phone lines already lighting up. Let's go to Kathy in Indiana. Kathy, you have you have thoughts on Trump DeSantis? Oh, hi, Megan. How are you? Hi. Hi, good. Good. Hey, thanks for taking my call. Um, I I like DeSantis. But I, I'm still a Trump fan. I, unlike you, do believe there was a lot of suspicion and there was some fraud that went on in the 2020 election. Um, unfortunately, since we have so many Democratic uh, left-leaning judges, they wouldn't allow the evidence to be told. I actually had a very, very close friend of mine that worked in the polls um, during the 2020 election. and She said it was just unreal, the things they were doing. Um, and there's just too many people that have come forward. So I think the problem is there, that it is so entrenched, the deceit in Washington. It has gotten so powerful that Trump was trying to unbury the bones. And unfortunately, you know, the rhinos don't want it to be known. And the Democrats definitely don't want it to be known. And so you're not ready for, like, to move on. You know, you've heard all these Republicans saying, I liked him, but it's time. Fresh blood. Right, right. No, absolutely not. No, I am not ready to move on because because they keep saying he needs to prove what he's going to do. Now, I get it. I get tired of listening to the same speech over and over. But one, no offense to the East Coast people, but he's a New Yorker. (laughs) I teach for a major university here in Indiana, and all the people from New York who I dearly love— but they're very brash, and they're very uh, what's the word? <laughs> Especially out of the New York kind of, New York real estate scene, that's for sure. Yes, they're very crude. So I just have to get past that brashness and just go. You know what? You know, you're a great person. Uh, does he have flaws? Yes, of course he does. But I think he also has the hoots buzz to to take people down and just say enough is enough because mm-hmm. our our okay. country. It's just, it is, it's just imploding with it in. And my students All right, I got it. around the world. I got to run, but I, I appreciate your voice and your opinion, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you for calling in. Let's see. Let's go to, uh, let me see, uh, David in North Carolina, and then we'll bring in Rick Grinnell. David, hi, what's on your mind? Hey, Megan. Um, I'm kind of on the opposite camp. I mean, I love Trump, a uh, big supporter. But it's like you said, you know, sometimes the relationship is over and you've got to move on. Um, I I think that Trump wrote the blueprint, but he's just not the vessel anymore to carry it forward. I think DeSantis, um, you know, I I think he I think he beat Biden like a like a drum. Mm. But I just don't see first, you know, suburban moms, never Trumpers. I don't see him getting over that. I mean, my wife is one of them. She would not vote for Trump if um, she was running against anybody. I mean, she voted Split for Biden. in the family. And, and she's a, yeah. 
and she's and she's a conservative. She mo- votes mostly Republican, but she just hates him. And Meanwhile, you're like, honey, I'll drop off that shot. absentee ballot for you. You can trust me. I got this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, David, I appreciate it. I like I like hearing from both sides. It's always fascinating our, in our audience. I would say they're more leaning on maybe it's time for new blood, but very, very healthy percentage saying, no, it's, it, we stay with Trump. Guys, thank you. I'm getting back to calls in just a minute, but I'm going to go to former Ambassador Rick Grinnell. And uh, of course, as I mentioned, acting director of national intelligence. Rick, great to have you back on the show. It's so fascinating. It's like great to hear from actual voters and actual actual Trump fans who are wrestling with some of these issues. You know, I had Rich Lowry on who made the case for why it's time to move on. You've read the National Review pieces. What is the case to not move on, to, to stick with President Trump and say to Ron DeSantis, maybe later, but not yet? Well, first of all, um, I should start by saying uh, I'm not an East Coaster. I live out West. And, you know, the East Coast types are typical. I mean, I've I've heard these arguments for a long time. Uh, they they tend to rush into uh, making big sweeping judgments like it's Donald Trump's fault that we didn't have a red wave. And meanwhile, I'm thinking we still have Arizona and Nevada that were counting ballots. And how do we know there hasn't been a big red wave? We might sweep it all. Let me just say one thing. If there was one person on the ballot this uh, midterms who was the most pro-Trump, had the best Trump uh, relationship, and President Trump went all in on, it's Carrie Lake. And the fact of the matter is, is Carrie Lake is a rock star nationally. Carrie Lake is solidly pro-Trump, and Carrie Lake is going to be the governor. I I can tell you, I've dug into these numbers. I've been working in Arizona and Nevada. She is going to be the uh the the governor of of Arizona and also I'll add this before I give you my opinion on Trump DeSantis <clears throat> President Trump picked Ted Budd JD Vance Adam Laxalt and one more um Oz and Herschel? no uh, one, one more that's going to win uh that could win Blake Masters could in win. Arizona right okay. so Herschel President Walker could win picked all of these people in the primary when they were not ahead and they didn't have the most money all of them are either on the cusp of winning or already won so let's just say that Blake Masters and Adam Laxalt win Donald Trump will be able to say I picked people in the primary that ultimately gave the Senate to the Republicans. We know the House is going to Republicans. Only on the East Coast is this idea that the Republicans win the House and the Senate, and yet somehow they're all disappointed because they didn't get their neighborhood picks, which let's be honest, Megan, you know this to be true. All of the staffers in television news live in New York or Washington, D.C., They care about Pennsylvania and New York more than anything. They lost Oz. They lost Lee Zeldin when they were told they were going to win in this big red wave. They're wildly disappointed. And so they move on. I've even seen people talking about let's vote in the leadership race this week. I'm like, is that madness? We still have two uh, senators that might still win out west. We're still counting votes out west. And you East Coasters are like already moving on. So with Mm -hmm. all of that said, I say bring it on. A healthy primary is good. I think it'll make Donald Trump better. I think it'll make uh, other people better, but make no mistake, I I know our base. Donald Trump runs, Donald Trump is the nominee. It doesn't matter what uh, happens in, in the race. If somebody else wants to jump in and literally lose, then they should jump in and lose. But But there's no question that there's only one person who has been tested and is absolutely going to win with the base. Nobody can get the crowds that Donald Trump has. And I'll just finish with this. If you think that any future president, whether it's Ted Cruz or Ron DeSantis or whomever, Carrie Lake, okay, some future president, if you don't think that their home is gonna be raided and they're gonna be impeached twice, you don't Mm. understand what's happening in the Democratic Party. These people are Mm. radicals on the left. Donald Trump is already with stood this incredible outpouring and he's still standing. I mean, that's such an important point that I I realize Trump's got his own personal style and is unlike anybody else's. But if you don't think they're going to toxify 
DeSantis or Cruz or Youngkin, even with his little sweater vest, they will. They made Mitt Romney into a crazy misogynistic ass because he said, I have binders full of women instead of the more artful binders full of women's resumes, which is just a slip of the tongue. They had him like uh, into Harvey Weinstein by the end of that news cycle. Yeah. Totally. And I think I think we've got to learn that lesson as Republicans. And by the way, the base has learned this lesson. They want a fighter. They don't want you backing down. They don't want you to say, "Okay, let's do better next time. We look, we're dealing with a Democratic Party that just put a woman on the Supreme Court who doesn't know the difference between a man and a woman. We are not (laughs) talking about a rational Democratic Party. These people are radicals. They have to be crushed. We can't negotiate with people who don't know the difference between a man and a woman. This is this is a, a literally a time where we have to have the best fighters and people who, by the way, who cares what the New York Times says? They're not our people. Our people are not mm-hmm. watching that. So why are we going to sit around with a bunch of bedwetters and saying, oh, we got to have somebody who's gentler and nicer? I say. But what about what? What about what's happening now? Because it's not just New York Times. Now you have the New York Post. You have the Journal. You have some on Fox News. You've got the Daily Wire. You've got, you know, more and more. Yes, never Trumpers like National Review. And I love those guys, but they're not pro-Trump. Although they backed him on, on most of his presidency, they just didn't want him to actually be the president. Um, so it's all this r- sort of right-wing media. A lot of never Trumpers, but they're not all never Trumpers that I just listed yeah. who are saying no. It's time. Yeah, totally. And I get that and I see it and I'm not blind to it, but I guess I'm old and I've worked on five presidential campaigns. (laughs) And I can tell you this, that this is extremely typical, that whenever the front runner is out there, there's always a lane for somebody says it's time to move on. There's always a lane for I'm the nicer one that can get along with the other side. Look, I think that that is um, a worthy uh, review, right? We should have somebody come up and say, I can get along with the other side and let, let's look at it. Let's review it and let's look at that person and decide. I'm just telling you that the that I'm a, a person who's not part of the East Coast elite. Uh, you could argue I'm part of the West Coast elite, but um, I, I try not to be. I, I'm pretty, uh, I grew up middle class, um, yeah. maybe lower middle class. I really identify with regular people. As you know, I'm gay. I I feel like I'm already an outsider in many ways in the Republican Party. I got to be careful with who I offend uh, so that I I can still um, maintain uh, credibility inside. So Mm -hmm. I I feel like I'm a scrappy fighter from the outside. And I know these people. And, And I'll say this. I have waited for a very long time to have a Republican Party that has first and second generation Americans and working class people as the core. You go to any Trump rally, you go anywhere, and we've got first and second generation Americans fighting hard, saying this country's going down the wrong path, and Donald Trump is the fighter that we need, and the media is all corrupt. And then you've got working class people who have always voted Democrat, and now they're coming around and voting with Donald Trump. Now we've got Hispanics. I fear that if we go the way of you know, the National Review or, or you know, some of these other uh, never Trump type uh, publications that they're going to try to put us into the party that is more like for the rich white guy. And mm-hmm. I don't want that party. I want the party to be, you know, a real. They call it they call it a country club Republicans, country club Republicans. Yeah. Now, wait, let and, me jump in. because I, I want to ask you about this. I've been dying to raise this. I'll, I'll say this. OK, quick, quick, because we have different. a Veterans Day tribute that we have to get to, too. That's a de- uh, it's a real hard transition because you lose the corporate money when you do that. And therefore, we're at an odd on some of these campaigns. It's going to take us a little while. Can I ask you quickly? There are reports that donors are pulling out of Trump, you know, in the campaign like crazy, that they're all going to back DeSantis and he's not going to have any money. Yeah, I don't see that at all. I know our California donors really well. They're more right wing than the average uh, voter. OK, OK. Let me ask you this. This is an interesting report by Josh Crashour. And he he's pointing out he's looking at the polls and he says, important political point here from NBC News, the somewhat disapprove of Biden voters backed. He calls them normie Republicans. That's just a short form for Twitter, Twitter, but could not stomach the MAGA types. And he gives a couple of examples in Georgia. They went a Kemp won these voters by 57 to 41. But Warnock uh, but they went for Warnock, 50 to 44. So it's basically a 19 
sorry, a 22 point swing. They they overwhelmingly voted for the GOP governor, but they sided with a Democrat senator, and he's saying candidate quality there, Herschel Walker. In New Hampshire, they went 59 to 39 for the GOP uh, governor, but they only went 72 to 25 for uh, Maggie Hassan. In other words, there too, it was a 34 point swing. They split their ticket, GOP Dem, in favor of the the Democrat over a Trump endorsed Dan Bulldog. Um, and they go through the same thing in Nevada. I take your point about Arizona because Carrie Lake is very pro Trump and also a, you know, election denier. That's the short form. And Blake Masters, less so. Uh, and she's doing better than he is, according to the early results. So, like, may, maybe she's an anomaly because she is a star, telegenic, powerful messenger. I mean, just a lot of great political qualities. But what do you make of that, that the somewhat disapprovers who you need to win an election, they were like, eh, and they want the so-called normies or country clubs or whatever we're calling these other guys? Well, first of all, I would say that it's not Donald Trump's fault that uh, certain candidates didn't perform well. You look at even in Pennsylvania, he endorsed Mastriano, which some people would say is a very far right candidate. And then he got in trouble for endorsing Dr. Oz because Dr. Oz was a far left candidate. So you can't really win in any way uh, with his candidates in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. I will give you that in New Hampshire, I think Bolduck was probably not our best choice to put forward. And, you know, you've got the governor uh, performing better. I think Georgia has been a mess for a long time. I guess my, my rule is, is that all politics is local. And I'll finish with this. In Arizona, you've got Abe Hamaday, who is a diehard pro-Trump, uh, first-generation American, Syrian and Venezuelan, out front of the whole ticket. He's the one who's getting the most votes, even better than Kerry Lake and Blake Masters. And he is wildly pro-Trump. And then you've got Adam Laxalt and Lombardo both performing pretty much the same, uh, but it's all about the local politics. Every state has a little bit different, uh, you know, in Michigan, for instance, it was all about abortion. And so it was really yeah. rough, but Tudor gave a real big run for her money. And in New York for Zeldin, he did amazingly well for a Republican yeah. in New York. He was a Trump uh, supported candidate. And I think that, uh, you know, you just got to look at each state. That's the great thing about the United States is we've got 50 well, states. New York is different than North Dakota. Michigan's interesting to me because I, I confess, I didn't follow Dan Bolduc that closely, nor Mastriano, although I saw every single piece of press on him was terrible. But I did talk to Tudor Dixon and I did follow that race a little bit more closely just because she was interesting. And Whitmer was just, just a nightmare during COVID. And they're now trying to make her into this like crazy extremist. Like she wasn't, you know, no. she she they, also has the little sweater vest. She she was pro-life and but she said she would not interfere if the voters said, you know, in this prop three vote that abortion is going to stay legal for, you know, basically the Roe standard uh, returned. She's like, I'm not going to interfere with that. And she did nod to the election denialism thing and the January 6th sort of, you know, did he really lose? So that was the most, quote, extreme thing she did. But they're really trying to make her sound like she's a lunatic. And so that was one of the things, Rick, that gave me pause in terms of so many members of the press, they, they hate, hate Trump. And they see the chance to, like, cut him out. It's like, this is it. Let's get it going. And it almost seems like an effort, like a group effort to blame all the losses on him because now this is the chance to sever the relationship between the GOP base and Trump. Look, first of all, let's just take the Michigan example. The Michigan thing is not about Trump at all, even though, you know, people who don't understand will try to make it about Trump. Uh, Gretchen had three times the money that Tudor did. Uh, Donald Trump endorsed Tudor, but let me just tell you, there was a whole bunch of uh, Trump people in Michigan who thought that Tudor was too moderate and were screaming at Trump don't invo- endorse Tudor, go with the four, the more right wing person. And Trump didn't listen to that. And he endorsed Tudor because he liked Tudor. But let's let's just be honest about Michigan. I was born there. I follow it very closely. That entire race was about abortion. That's all Gretchen talked about. There was, uh, you know, Elise Slotkin should have lost. She eked it out and won on the abortion issue alone because you had, Mm. you know, in and around Ann Arbor going crazy with students on the abortion issue. But the reality is, is that Michigan didn't have the ability, didn't have money, Tudor didn't have money to combat the extremism that they were trying to do in scaring uh, voters on the abortion issue. Michigan was Mm. literally all about an abortion. It was about abortion. Okay, finally, 
is Trump really going to announce for president on Tuesday? And should he? Well, look, I I really don't have any specific information to know exactly what he's going to do. I've been part of the conversations of up and down and, and, and what. I'll leave it to him to decide exactly what's going to happen on Tuesday. I will just say this is that, um, you know, Donald Trump wants to run for president. Um, if he runs for president, he's the nominee. There's just no doubt in my mind. Anybody who gets involved in the primary, you're welcome to it. It's going to be rough. You can't be surprised that Donald Trump is going to play rough. Uh, any undercurrent from people, whether it's Mike Pompeo or DeSantis or Nikki Haley, who literally want to try to stay under the radar with donors, but collect the money and keep telling people you're running, but not tell reporters you're running, it gets out. The Trump team knows you can't be surprised that we're going to play hardball. It's a primary. Mm-hmm. Welcome to uh, American politics. What do you think about Kaylee McEnany saying he should not announce this before Georgia? Georgia's too important to win. Look, I think there's a lot of people with different opinions. I think everybody in the media knows that Donald Trump is already running. I don't buy into this East Coast idea that, oh, somehow announcing before the election or before Georgia makes it about Trump. I mean, look, you could argue that Donald Trump has a massive army. And when he focuses the massive army on something, they come out. I don't buy this East Coast thing that, oh, the people aren't going to come out because of Trump. You had a caller, David, that was saying that his wife voted for Biden, but he was trying to say she's a diehard conservative. I'm sorry. I don't believe that anyone is a diehard conservative if you voted for Joe Biden simply because you don't like mean tweets. Look at your gas price. Mm. (laughs) Um, Now, wait, just before I let you go, what will happen? What do you think is Trump's been sort of intimating it's not going to go very nicely for DeSantis if he does run against Trump in a primary? What do you think that would look like? Well, look, I I don't think anybody should be surprised that we're going to play hard if you jump into the primary, Donald Trump wants to be the nominee and it's politics. So put on your big boy pants. No complaining. Don't say he's too mean. Uh, this is the primary. We're confident that if Donald Trump runs, Donald Trump is the nominee. So fun talking to you, Rick Grinnell. Great to see you, my friend. All the best. All right. And we will be right back with a special Veterans Day message. Don't go away. Today, our nation celebrates Veterans Day, a day when we take time to remember all U.S. military veterans who served, fought, and sacrificed for the freedoms we have today. Over the last two years on this show, we have had the privilege of profiling some of our nation's most heroic veterans. Incredible, in-depth discussions about the battles they fought. Those are my most memorable interviews. When people ask me, what's your favorite interview? Those are the ones that come to mind. Uh, These battles that they fought abroad, And then in some cases, when they returned back home, more of an internal battle in some cases. In May 2020, for Memorial Day, back when we were just an audio-only podcast, I spoke with Rob O'Neill, the U.S. Navy SEAL who shot Osama bin Laden. He shared with us a chilling, an amazing story about the conversation he and his teammates had before leaving on that mission. Before we left, I had one of my guys say, um, because we accept the death, that's it. We're going to die. He said, don't take this the wrong way because I'm 100% going. Don't worry about that. I'm going. I just need to say it out loud. If we know we're going to die, why are we going? And, and so we had a conversation and we had a conversation. We said, okay, well, we're not going after bin Laden for the fame or the reward um, or the bravado. We are going after Osama bin Laden for the single mom who dropped her kids off at elementary school on a Tuesday. And 45 minutes later, she jumped to her death out of a skyscraper because that was a better alternative than whatever the hell was going on inside at 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. And her last gesture of human decency was holding her skirt as she jumped out of a building and murdered herself. She was never supposed to be in the fight. We're supposed to be in the fight. That's why we're going. Oh, my God. If you don't have chills and listening to that, you you do. I know you do. (laughs) Like me. Robert O'Neill, we salute you uh, and your many sacrifices for our country. This past Memorial Day, we spoke with Medal of Honor recipient Dakota Meyer. In 2009, while serving in Afghanistan, Dakota and his team were ambushed by more than 50 Taliban fighters. Over the course of the six-hour battle, Dakota defied military orders and repeatedly entered and re-entered the ambushed area to rescue his trapped and wounded teammates. I remember reaching down and and uh, picking, I think I picked up Gunny, Gunny Johnson first, and Gunny was the biggest one. 
And I picked him up, threw him over my shoulders, and I, I started to carry him out. And I just slipped, and I fell. Like, it was like every bit of energy I had left, I fell flat on my face. And I got back up, and, and uh, the uh, Afghan soldiers, I see them, they're, they're right there. And they're going to, to grab the guys. And, and I was kind of upset. I, I, I kind of got mad at them, and I said, hey, don't, don't touch my guys. I said, I'll, I'll take them home. And uh, Fazel came up to me and he said, no, he said, uh, and I, I did, I, I started crying. Like I literally, like when I fell with Gunny Johnson, like I literally started crying. And mm -hmm. uh, I'll never forget Fazel came up to me and said, I don't, don't cry. You can't show this weakness. And uh, I was like, you're right. And, uh, and he said, the Afghans want to help you get your guys out because they just watched you help get their guys out. And uh, it was such a, a kind of for me, it was like a monumental moment in my life of, you know, it's not us against them. It's just it's, it's good against bad. Mm, my goodness. These interviews. Dakota is credited with saving the lives of 36 U.S. and Afghan troops that day. Oh, we thank you so much, Dakota, for your service. The world is better because of men like that. In March 2021. We spoke with now retired Navy SEAL Jocko Willink. Jocko, led, he led the most highly decorated special operations unit of the Iraq war. You talk to these guys now, everybody knows Jocko. And I have to say, if you're a parent and you want your child to learn how to deal with adversity and taking ownership, listen to Jocko, read Jocko's books. He's got a whole series for kids. Jocko shared with us the story of having to deal with the fallout of an operation that went wrong. Some of my guys ended up in a firefight with friendly Iraqi soldiers who had a U.S. Marine with them. And it's a nightmare. One of the Iraqi soldiers got killed. A couple other ones got wounded. One of my guys got wounded. And it was only by the grace of God that, that none of my guys were killed. It was just an absolute nightmare. I couldn't feel comfortable t picking the person to blame. And I just was trying to figure, is it this guy? Should I blame this guy? Should I blame this other guy? And as I'm sitting there, I, I realized like a bolt of lightning hit me that the reason I couldn't figure out who to blame was because there was only one person to blame and that person was me. I'm, I'm the overall guy in charge. I'm responsible for what happens. Whatever happens is on me. And so I went in there and, and, and took ownership of the entire incident. And, and, you know, this is not the first time that I ever had this idea. This is how I was brought up in the SEAL teams. And, and really, this is how I was brought up as a, as a human. When something goes wrong, you don't blame other people. You take ownership. The, the, the SEALs are just, they're cut from a different cloth. I mean, it's just, you know what they've been through. Thank you for your service, Jacko Willink. Last but certainly not least, in August 2021, we spoke with retired U.S. Navy SEALs and twins, Marcus and Morgan Luttrell. In 2005, while on a mission to kill or capture a high-ranking Taliban terrorist, there was an ambush. Marcus was the only survivor of the attack, but it took six days for the military to find and rescue him. He later wrote a book titled Lone Survivor. Morgan told us the story of what it was like for him and his family when they found out that Marcus had been rescued. Master Chief Gothra was out there, and he's the one that would answer the phone. And by this time, there's anywhere, there's about 40 SEALs out there. And we would all pile into my father's bedroom, which was little bitty. And shoulder to shoulder, and Master Chief's on the phone. He's like, yes, sir. Roger that. Understood. Roger that. Yes, sir. And he dropped his head. And I mean, we lost it, right? We, we was like, oh, my God. You know, the worst case scenario. And I'm sitting there staring at him. Everybody was crying around. I was in there staring at him. And he, 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 he gives us a thumbs up. Anyhow, my parents came walking in. And then some of my best friends came walking in. They saw everybody else crying. Mom loses it. Dad loses it. And they're like, no, no, no. Like, they, they, they found him. He's rescued. So um, I mean, I don't remember who it was, walked out to the crowd and said they found him. And I mean, it sounded like the Super Bowl. Like I could hear it from Afghanistan. So all the, but the problem with that was all the, all my friends and family were celebrating the fact that we found my brother, but all the SEALs that were out there and all the other, and there were some Marines and Army and everybody just started to, come out and, and spend time with us. We were still very stoic because we're down. We're down men. Mm -hmm. Wow. In the end, the three other SEALs Marcus was on the mission with did not survive. So in addition to honoring Marcus and Morgan Luttrell today, we also salute Lieutenant Michael Murphy and Petty Officers Danny Dietz and Matt Axelson. 
Morgan Luttrell has also found another way to continue serving serving this country. This past Tuesday, he became Congressman-elect Morgan Luttrell. He will be serving in Congress, representing Texas's 8th Congressional District. Yay! Congrats, Morgan. So proud of you. So to all these heroes and all of our listeners and viewers who served as well, we thank you for your service. All right, I want to take a few more of your calls in the time that we have left. Let's go to let's go to Kathy in Florida. She's got thoughts. Kathy, what's on your mind? Hi, Megan. Just I mean, I love Trump. I love what he did for the country. I love that he exposed the media for what it was. But it's time for someone new. And if Trump really wanted to succeed and we could be so successful, but we need someone who's going to pull the country together, not pull it further apart. Mm. What if what if he endorsed DeSantis? Can you imagine? I, it, I mean, we could go so far, and mm. he could be so successful, and he could claim all of that. But it doesn't sound like Trump. <laughs> it doesn't seem like that's no, where I we're know. going. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, thank you. I want to squeeze a couple more in. Bill in Iowa, what are your thoughts? Oh, it's Dale in Iowa. Oh, Dale, hi. Well, what's, what's, what are your thoughts, uh, Dale? Uh, we've talked a few times. First of all, I want to say thank you for that tribute to veterans. I want to say shout out to all my fellow veterans out there, Amen. especially those who served overseas. That, that was still the, one of the highlights of my career. As I look at the, the flag draped coffin, or the flag that draped my father's coffin that's folded, it's such a reminder that every day, everything that we have and we owe, is to people who voluntarily sign up for this Absolutely. assignment. Absolutely. Um, I can give you a, a little bit of, from Iowa, since we're first in the nation for the Republican side of the caucus. I'm an independent. I think both sides are screwed up. But he's, he's lost support, and he's just not lost support, Trump. He's lost support in the western part of the state, which is the most conservative. And it's, it's basically what I heard when I was uh, back there last week was, a great leader knows when it's time to pass the mantle. He'd had great policies, but it's time to move on. We don't need any more. Well, how he's the greatest thing. We're done. We're done. We're done. We're done. Mm. Yesterday when I heard Winston Sears, Lieutenant governor of Virginia, by the way, a fellow veteran say the same thing. It's time to move on. Mm. We shall see. Uh, thank you for the call, Dale, and thank you for your service and that of your family. Dave in Delaware, you've got thoughts. We well, don't take a lot of calls from Delaware. A pleasure to speak with you. What are your thoughts? Sure. Your, your last caller summed it up so well. Uh, I've been a huge supporter of Donald Trump for many years, but it's time for us to move on. There's been a lot of gross injustices done to Donald, but it's time for us to move on. And the issue isn't the primary that I'm concerned about. It's the general election that we are all concerned about, that we need to win the general election. And there's now just too much noise and confusion with Donald and too much separation. So we need to come together. And if uh, Donald could be so humble to uh, support someone like a DeSantis, also like uh, Christy Noem. I read her book, mm-hmm. which was out. She's, yeah, she's one of the favorites like for that. the for the VP slot. Sorry to cut you off, my friend. I gotta, I'm got i up against a hard break, but thank you for your call. Thank you all for calling and for listening. I couldn't do it without you guys. And uh, I'm, I I just feel like we had a big week together and I appreciate you you being with me. Uh, listen, next week on the show, we got Victor Davis Hanson. Can't wait to talk to him. Senator Rand Paul, Alex Berenson, Dr. Laura, and Doug Brunt will join us next week. Mm-hmm. Thanks for joining us. Download the show, go to youtube.com and subscribe to it. Megan Kelly, thanks for listening and have a great weekend.